your attention, please. Hello, my name is Star Fusel Abel Kezia, and I, I would want to serve you as a priest sign very soon. It's now time to start finding your seats for Sabbath services. Shabbat Shalom. My name is Daughter of Israel Abel Peace, and I want to serve you forever as a priestess starting very soon. It's now a privilege and an honor to present to you the sons and daughters of Israel Abel now entering the sanctuary. It's a privilege and an honor to turn it over to one of the daughters of Israel Abel Shabbat Shalom. My name is Mishaki Hawkins, daughter of Yezra Abel. Today I'll be introducing two speakers that will be tell you more about the importance of keeping Yahweh's laws. Please stand for the first speaker. Shalom. My name is Daughter of Yeshua Abel, Daniel Ogans Hawkins, and the title of my speech is Either Way You Must Obey. Mm-hmm. Obedience to one set is essential. Deuteronomy 17.9 reads, Go to the priest who are Levites, and to the judge who is in office in office at that time. As for their decision, in, they will give you the sentence of judgment. Israel Hawkins is the priest in office at this time who teaches peace. The fifth book of Israel, chapter 14, verse 178, pastor states, You, my children, and your Yahweh's saints. Ephesians 6, verse 1 reads, Children, obey your parents and Yahweh, for this is right. Israel Hawkins is our priest and parent. Either way, you must obey. I turn it over to one who obeys the one sin. Shalom. You may be seated. The title of my speech is Yahweh has put spirit upon him. In the 10th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 11, verse 39, says, Well, here in Yahiran 3, verse 34, he says, For he whom Yahweh has spit, has spit, speaks the words of Yahweh, the laws and the prophets, for Yahweh does not hit, give his spirit sparingly. In verse 135, Pastor says, Not sparingly, he hasn't gave this to me. Sparingly, the spirit of Yahweh will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the reverence of Yah. That's his prophecy of this work in these last days, which will make him of quick understanding, and his delight will be in the reverence of Yah. 
He would not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor will he reproof after the hearings of his ears. In verse 137 it says, But with righteousness will he judge the poor. Will he judge the poor and reproof with iniquity? With iniquity for the meek. Humble of the earth, he was to write the earth with the rod that is judgment of his mouth, and correct them, and with the breath of his lips, with his lips will he stay the wicked, that is judge the wicked. We sit at the feet of truly a great teacher. He has been teaching me for seven years, and I have all eternally to learn from him. And rather and receive Yahweh Spirit holy Yahweh Spirit through him. It is such it is such a great opportunity to be a part of Pastor's work. This is Yahweh's work. And we must believe into our great one sin. May I bless the rest of this awesome feast and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. And now we turn it over to the queens of the house of Yahweh. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. Before I get started, I wanted to show you something really special. Look at this. This is the shirt that our overseer was talking about. So we got these at our locations, and you're going to want to get one of these, or two, or three, or four. Okay? So we have a really great lineup of speakers for you today. We put together some that have been here all their lives, some of that have been here just a couple of years. But they all have one thing in common. They listen to and obey the one that Yahweh has sent. Okay? And I don't know if any of you realize it, but that's the theme of this feast, that we would listen to and be obedient to the one that Yahweh has sent to us, right? And why is that important? Why is it important to believe into and obey the one that Yahweh sends? Helps to get us in the kingdom. Anybody else? So we can learn what to teach, so that we can teach what we've learned. Anything else? Can't hear you? He's the voice of Yahweh. He's the voice of Yahweh. Yes, he is. And remember, we're supposed to obey Yahweh's voice. And even in the times of Moshe, it was always said to obey the voice of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh is not going to be calling us on the phone and telling us to obey him. Right? Um, Hopefully, nobody is getting calls like that. (laughs) Yahweh works through people. And he works through people, and he tells us who he's going to work through. And it's a word that begins with P. Now, Moshe 3, 7. Does anyone know the word that begins with P? Prophecy, yes. And Yahweh says he's not going to have any other work unless he tells us about it first, which is really great for us because it's a no-brainer. Uh, you prophesied of? Nope, Kate. Okay. All right, not following you. You prophesied of, okay, no, not following you. Israel Hawkins, Isaiah 44, Zachariah, oh, look at this. Who are we going to follow? Israel Hawkins, right? So really, it's Yahweh's made it very easy for us because all we have to do is obey the scriptures that tell us to listen to the one that he sends, right? Okay, sometimes it's easier to say it than to do it. Is that true? Okay, and there's a reason why. The adversary has a lot of pulls, and she wants to pull us out of Yahweh's house. So she comes along, and she's got little things that go completely and totally contrary to what Yahweh's given to us. And she says, has Yahweh really said in Moshe 3, verse 7? And we have to be wise enough to say, 
Well, yes, Yahweh has said Amosha 3, verse 7, right? And, y'all, you know, the adversary comes in different forms, too. The adversary is not going to call you on the phone and say, you know, Susie, uh, this is Satan, the devil, the adversary. Um, I'm calling to deceive you today. No, she's not going to do that. You're not going to know you're being deceived. So our speakers today are going to help you remain grounded in this faith, okay? Praise Yahweh. All right, now I'm going to start by introducing the first speaker, which is myself, and I'm going to go ahead and get started into my speech, okay? Praise Yahweh. And the title of my speech today is Stick with Positive Influences. Stick with Positive Influences. And we've all learned from the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program on page 118 of the self-control unit, what a positive influence, what an influence is. Let's start by that. It says, what are influences? An influence is something or someone, it can be Satan, the devil, the adversary, that can affect the way that you think, feel, and act. Influence is, can also affect what you value, or they can motivate you to adopt new values. Motivate you to adopt new values. We were out in the world doing our thing, and we were influenced by a booklet, a person, or some teacher, righteous teacher, right? We were influenced to take on a new value, were we not? And that's why we're here. So do you see that you were influenced to get you here? That was an influence, okay? I'm going to continue reading in the self-control unit. It says, anything that has the potential to affect what you value also has the potential to affect your character and hence your self-control. There are many other influences. They range from subtle and harmless to obviously dangerous. In fact, some influences are so subtle that you may not even realize that you're being influenced to think or behave in a particular way. Now, we've learned from 1 Corinthians 15.33, Yahweh says, do not be deceived. Okay, I'm going to change this up a little bit because it says bad company corrupts, corrupts righteous character, right? Do not be deceived. Negative influences corrupt righteous character, right? That's interchangeable, okay? And pastor's been teaching us for a very long time to come out of this world, right? So we can be influenced to love something or to hate something. And through the years in the house of Yahweh, you can see where someone's been very gung-ho. They love the brothers and sisters. They love the work of Yahweh. They love everything. They absolutely adore our pastor. They love the laws. And then pretty soon they get to the point that they've allowed themselves to be influenced to where they'll walk right past someone. And if someone says shalom to them, they will completely ignore the person and not even look at them. Or completely quit coming to services. Or then all of a sudden they don't want to keep that law anymore or this law. Okay, so we really got to be on guard. And continuing in the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, the character unit, page 60, it tells us that influences are all around us. I hope everyone's taking notes because these, what we're going to bring out today will keep you in the house of Yahweh. Influences are all around us. Your values play such a key role in developing your character that you must be aware of how influences affect the things that are important to you. Raise your hand if the house of Yahweh is important to you. Okay, great. So we've established that. Everything you hear, experience, and see, as well as every interaction and every conversation that you're part of, have the potential to change the way you think and feel about the things you value. So I want you to remember, you just held your hand up, right? We all held our hand up that the house of Yahweh was important to us. At any given time, the next conversation you're in, the next thing you hear, the next thing you see, the next lie you're told can affect the way that you feel about what you just said was the most important thing to you, right? So you think it's kind of important that we guard ourselves? Very important. It can actually cause us to either stay or fall away. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of what you all want to do, but how you are influenced can affect what you value or motivate you to create new values. We've been motivated to create new values when we came to the house of Yahweh, right? 
and our value system being the laws of Yahweh. Now in Deuteronomy 4.9, Deuteronomy 4.9, it goes right along with this because it says, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself from forgetting the things your eyes have seen. Now remember, we just said up there in the character unit, everything you hear, experience, and see. Do you see how it correlates with the book of Yahweh, the peaceful solution? The peaceful solution and the book of Yahweh are interchangeable. Nor let them depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them. If you value this, you'll teach them to your children and your children's children, your grandchildren. Okay? Now I'm going to do a little demonstration here. And I'm, this is the part of, my, of, of the speech that I'm, I've been kind of a little bit nervous about because it involves, remember the title of the speech was Stick with Positive Influences. This involves tape. And anyone that knows me knows I'm not the most coordinated person in the house of Yahweh. So we're going to have to kind of pray for me to be able to get this demonstration done without getting wrapped up in a bunch of tape. Okay? All right. So y'all praying for me silently, right? Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to, I got this here, piece of tape. All right. Now, I got the house of Yahweh. I'm going to show you this here. I got the house of Yahweh on one side, and I got the world on the other side. It's a piece of tape. And, you know, when we have ourselves in both the world and the house of Yahweh, and we haven't come out like our pastor says, you know, we listen to the sermons because the radio has lots of nice sermons on it. See that 88.9 FM? right there and we want to put that on the house of Yahweh side right and that influence it sticks that stuck with me but if I dabble in the world and I'm listening to worldly music that's going to stick on the worldly side right now you know I can be on my computer or my television and I can be watching the overseer right which would be a really great influence right put him right there on the house of Yahweh side but I can also maybe every once in a while get weak and be watching the TV shows, right? See how it's sticking? Oh, but what about this? I come to the feast and I have all this righteous fellowship. See, do you see you on there, ladies? Because I'm fellowshipping with you right there. There's you. And then when it's not feast or sometimes I kind of can get around those who have left the house of Yahweh. Oh, let me get them on there. And I'm in the world, and that's sticking. Do you remember, I, I've got to tell you, that with every choice that we make, every influence that's set in front of us, it's going to cause us to make a choice one day. Now, when we're faced with a situation, or something really aggravates us, upsets us, we have a time of weakness. If this is us, and we've got both things going on in our lives, both feet and both, one foot over here and one foot over there, There's a 50-50 opportunity that you are going to make the wrong choice. Because you will only half in. Do you see what I'm trying to explain here? You're only half in. Now there's other righteous things. I can go on and on. You could have this here. Those are some House of Yahweh magazines, right? Or you can be getting into the latest this, that, and the other. You can be doing romance novels. Bad, bad, bad. Or you could be this little boy here. See, he's getting his House of Yahweh books. You see that? It's important that we... This is Gorilla Tape. And to be in the House of Yahweh, you have to... (laughs) You have to be putting on the Gorilla Tape. In order to stay... Sometimes it's hard. Okay? But I want to show you that with the gorilla tape and only being one side is the house of Yahweh, you got your prophetic words, right? So if you're presented with a worldly influence, uh uh-oh. Oh. Oh. It's not going to stick. It's not going to stick. 
because you have both feet per- firmly planted in the house of Yahweh. And when a tough choice, a tough time, a big test comes before you, you are not going to cave in because those and negative influences are just going to flick right off. Okay? But only if we make the right choices. Only. Okay. And continuing here in The Peaceful Solution, which is one of the greatest books in, in town, In the character unit, page 79, it says maintaining your positive character means protecting and guarding yourself from influences and choices that could lead to developing negative character traits. Maintaining your positive character must be done on a daily basis. It must be done minute by minute. That's the peaceful solution. I want you to do a study at home. Just quiet study when you're by yourself. Look up how many times Yahweh says, be very careful, be diligent to, do not forget, take heed to yourself, do not forget all those things. Now, is it because you always like, you know, um, I have to remind them because they might forget. No, because it's very easy to get pulled into this world and pulled out of the house of Yahweh. It just takes one negative friend and you're gone. It just takes listening to one negative comment and you're gone. It takes holding on to a grudge and you're gone. It takes not obeying one law and you're gone it takes leaving the work of Yahweh and going out in the world and choosing this sticky mess the 14th book of Israel part 1 chapter 15 verse 156 it says guard yourself brethren if you're going back out in the world those who are staying here I bless you for doing so those who are going back out into the world guard yourselves carefully because Satan is like a roaring lion out to get those who worship Yahweh to turn to from righteousness the peaceful solution character education program character unit page 70 71 mirror mirror With so many negative influences in today's society, it can be challenging to obtain a positive character. This is where having someone who has a moral character to imitate really helps. I want to show you mine. Right there, right there. That's, That's my role model right there. That's my role model. This is where having someone who has a moral character to imitate really helps. Imitating others is something we all do, whether we admit it or not. We could imitate the people that are out there eating unclean foods, talking against the house of Yahweh, not understanding that they're about to make a choice that's going to cause death. Or we can do what Hebrews says, Hebrews 6.12. It says, in order that you do not become slothful, lazy, or disinterested, but followers and imitators, imitators, of those who through the faith and patience inherit the promises. And for my last two quotes here, we've got the character unit, page 71. By becoming a person of integrity, you too can become a role model and influence someone else to obtain a positive moral character. Is that what we want to do? Yep. That's our goal and our reward. And Yahweh says in the fourth book of Israel, and this is chapter 8, verse 73, Go over to Hebrews and keep in mind everything that we've read here. Please try to remember every scripture we cover because this is what is going to bring you to perfection. This is what is training you for the job that you're going to have to learn in order to go teach others. You are going to be teaching these things to the nations very soon. That's just our first assignment because what comes after that? The universe. Praise Yahweh for allowing me to come up here and speak to you today. And at this time, I'd like to turn the services over to our next speaker. Okay, welcome home, great saints of Yahweh. You may all be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my speech today is Connecting Through the One Scent. Connecting Through the One Scent. You know, we live in a world where mankind is searching constantly, trying to find the connection to their maker. You know, they go seeking answers and they hook up to many outlets. Each outlet all leads to different directions. That's why we're now facing 4,200 religions today. 4,199 religions believe their creator is a god. 
all but one. We, the house of Yahweh, know for sure that Yahweh, the creator and heavenly father, is not a god, right? For your notes, Isaiah 45, verse 5. My purpose today is to point you to the one true life lifeline who has tapped into the source of all knowledge, but how we find and keep this connection. So we have another one sent, which is the scriptures giving us many hints to who holds that authority. Who is this one sent? Now let's search it out and see where the world went wrong. I'm going to need your help to fill in the blanks, okay? So our first hint is Yachanan 6 verse 29, and it says, this is the work of Yahweh that you believe into him whom he has sent. So we know that we're looking for a him and not a her. So why does the whole world fall after her, Satan, the ruler of all the gods, right? So we know they went wrong. Now our second hint is Isaiah 8 verse 20. If they speak not according to Yahweh's word, the laws and prophets, then there is no lights in them, right? So we know that these prophets are the prophets of deceits and the prophets of um, falsehoods. Now to the world, let's try this again. Now our third hint is they must do the will of Yahweh, right? So we're going to turn over to Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verse 7, found on page 949. Hebrews 10, verse 7. Anyone there? Now it says, and then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book of Yahweh. It is written to do your will, O Yahweh. Okay, and for your notes also, Yachanan 5, verse 39. So you know the will is to fulfill all the prophecies spoken about, um, spoken about him to the finest detail. Now number four is to preach the message of repentance and conversion, spoken of by all of his prophecies predecessors that came before him. Now all the world is dead through the trespassing of their sins, but this one son awakens us to life through the message of repentance and conversion, which the false preachers cannot do. Now our scent, the fifth tip is this one scent comes with the personal tag number 1074. Yes. And we're getting warmer, but we're almost there. Okay. So hint number six. He comes in the name of Yahweh, not boasting about himself, but he glorifies Yahweh and he magnifies Yeshua, right? So after these hints, I ask you, who is the one sent? Israel Hawkins. All the proof points to him. Today, our one sent is described as the chosen branch on the tree of life. His name is Israel Hawkins. The world hates him, but we, the house of Yahweh, love and adore him. And that's another hint, right? They, the world hates him. Now, we have many great reasons in loving pastor, right? Can you imagine needing to stay alive, but you cut yourself off from the one main supporting branch? We little twigs are to the branch, or we little twigs are connected to this branch, but if we break ourselves away from him, are we connected to him? No. So I encourage you to grab hold of Israel Hawkins. Now, does Israel Hawkins have a one cent? <laughs> okay, yes, you better believe it. He does. Because it is the pattern of the kingdom. Yahweh always sends his people help. Yahweh's, Israel Hawkins' one cent is Yeshua Messiah, the roots and offspring of David. And we're going to turn over to Yachanan 15. Yachanan 15, verse 5. And this is um, Yeshua speaking here. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him produces much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. So without Israel Hawkins, we can do nothing, right? Okay. Israel Hawkins' task is a little more difficult than ours. You know, he has to believe or trust into him that he cannot see in Yeshua Messiah, right? But we see Israel Hawkins quite often. Okay, now, can Israel Hawkins break himself away from the roots or vine and still live? No. He'll become a dead branch. Now, since we have all our pieces now, we're going to put it together. Okay, so, who is our roots? The roots of the tree, right? Who is our root? Yeshua Messiah, right? He's the vine and he's the root. Okay, so who's our golden branch? 
that produces golden oil. Israel Hawkins, right? And then we being the twigs that attach to Israel Hawkins, right? Okay, so this is us. And through obeying and believing into this one scent, then we bring forth those fruits of righteousness. Okay, so Yeshua is the one who feeds the chosen branch and all the food and inspiration needed to stay connected to Yahweh. And in doing so, he also feeds us. It is the one pattern, the one work, the one plan, the one house which is built through the one support system, the laws and prophecies that makes up this one family. Without believing and obeying Israel Hawkins, we will not be in the kingdom. Now, the one scent is for every generation, including the seventh era. We are coming to perfection through connecting to the greatest teacher, Israel Hawkins, who is like our father Yahweh. In doing so, we can become those one cents who will teach the universe, right? Teaching them the perfect will and plan of Yahweh. Now, I want us to remember, in Genesis 1.26, it tells us we'll become in the family, we'll become the family of Yahweh, who is the family of those who will eternally be sent. So I encourage you to get ready for the next assignment by training now and holding fast to this branch. And with this, I turn it over to the next speaker. Shalom, you may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Your name came up in a conversation the other day. What do you think was said about you? We all want to know what is said about us, right? So you're probably thinking that this was the conversation that your parents had about you last night after supper, or maybe the one that your supervisor had about you, about you, said about you after you didn't complete a job properly, or maybe it's the conversation that your friends had under the sukkah this morning, right? Those are all conversations that people have. And sometimes our names come up in those conversations. Well, that's not the conversation I'm talking about. I'm referring to the conversations that are being held in the courts of heaven about each and every one of us. What do you think was said about you? Was it said that you are humble and obedient? That you believe into the one sent? Was it said that you are a willing servant? Oh, look at her. She is striving for perfection. What was said about you when your name came up in the conversation in the courts of heaven? Now, you only are the only one here that truly knows what was said about you. Now, I want you to think about it. Let's look at an example of this while you turn over to Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. It says, now there was a day when the sons of Yahweh came to present themselves before Yahweh. And Satan, the adversary, and the accuser came also. Yahweh said to Satan, where do you come from? Satan answered Yahweh and said, from going back and forth on the earth and walking up and down it. Then Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Eob? There is none like him in the earth. A perfect, blameless, and upright man, one who reverence Yahweh and shuns evil. Did you get that? There was a conversation going on in the courts of heaven. The sons of Yahweh and Satan came before Yahweh. Now, what did Yahweh say about you? Look back to verse 8. Have you considered my servant Yob? Put your name there. What would Yahweh say about you? Would he say that you are blameless, upright, and walk in his ways? That you reverence him and you shun evil? Does Yahweh see your righteousness? Psalms 4, verse 3 says, But know that Yahweh sets apart the righteous ones for himself, for Yahweh will hear them when they call him. For we strive to be righteous. What was said about you in the courts of heaven yesterday? 
Since we have been called to the great house of Yahweh, we have learned many things. We learned about the feast days, the Sabbath. We learned about the importance of unity as a family. We learned about rejoicing through tests and trials, the importance of endurance, and most recently, we learned about the white garment of humility. These are just a few of the many things that we have learned since we've been here. But after all that we have learned from the great house of Yahweh, when your name comes up in the conversation in the courts of heaven, what is said about you? Are you striving for perfection? Are you showing Yahweh your righteousness? Remember Psalms 4, verse 3. Do you practice what you've been taught? We show that we believe into the one sent by our obedience. The definition of obey from Merriam-Webster's dictionary says to follow commands or guidance. When we obey the one sent and the one he sends, we are obeying Yahweh. Positive law number 172 says listen and obey Yahweh's anointed servant the overseer of the house of Yahweh. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 to 19. Children, when you obey your parents, teachers, guardians, and older siblings, you show Yahweh that you are willing to obey him. And when we obey our heads, counselors, and supervisors, we show Yahweh that we are willing to obey him as well. Positive law number 210. So show honor and respect to parents. We find that in Exodus 20, verse 12. And positive law number 209 says, show honor and respect for Yahweh's appointed teachers. Leviticus 9, verse 32. Now, being obedient and following instructions is not always easy. And at times, it may be something that we don't want to do. But if we want to receive the many blessings and promises from Yahweh, it's something that we must do. Now, in our everyday life, there are many things that we obey. There's many times that we obey rules or laws without even thinking about it. When you're driving down the street and the light turns red, you stop and you wait for it to turn green before you keep driving. We automatically obey all of these different things that authorities have placed over us without thinking twice about it. So here's a few examples of obedience in the scriptures. And for sake of time, I'm not going to get to all of them, but we know that Noah proved his obedience to Yahweh, and we find this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. And it says here that the right, we, it says that Noah found regard and honor in the eyes of Yahweh. The righteous people we read about in their, the scriptures, they prove their obedience. And in these last days, we must prove our obedience also. And in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, Yahweh says that he saw Noah as righteous before him. So throughout the scriptures, there's many more. We can read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, and in Jacob chapter 2, verse 23, about what Yahweh says about Abraham. And we have Yeshua's Messiah's example in Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52, where it's the story of when Yeshua was at the Feast of Passover when he was 12 years old with his parents, and they went looking for him, and they found him at the priest learning. But it says that he went back with his parents, and he was subject to them. He obeyed them. Now, because Yeshua obeyed his parents, and he obeyed Yahweh, and strictly kept all of Yahweh's laws, we all have the opportunity to become members of Yahweh's family. So no one can make you obey, just like no one makes you salt your food or pray your three times. It's something that we must all choose. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 30 when it speaks of how we are free moral agents to choose, but Yahweh tells us that there are many promises if we obey and keep his laws. So what was said about you when your name came up in the courts of heaven? Let it be said in the courts of heaven that this last day's house of Yahweh keeps all of Yahweh's laws, that we obey the one sent, and that we desire to be a part of Yahweh's family forever. Let us continue striving for perfection, and I would like to thank the greatest teacher in the world, the great Kahan Yezro Abel Hawkins, for giving me the opportunity to speak today and allowing all of us to be taught Yahweh's laws. And with this, if you stand, I'll turn over to the next speaker. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. I was only a baby when my parents came to the great house of Yahweh and agreed with Jacob. How wonderful is this place? This is none other than the great house of Yahweh. My story is a classic example of the ripple effect. You see, my parents believed into the one sent and taught me to believe into the one sent as well. 
The most valuable lesson I have learned is to search out the book of Yahweh and read. Not one of these will be neglected. For it is written, Yahweh is your shepherd, they shall not want. For his mouth has commanded it, and his spirit has gathered them. That's Isaiah 34, 16. The book of Yahweh has always intrigued me. It seems like a giant storybook with no end. I learned how to read the book of Yahweh when I was three years old and got my very own book of Yahweh when I was six years old. Pastor taught my parents to love to study, and my parents taught me to as well. And those who are wise will shine as the brightness of the heavens and will turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I wanted to learn more about our Creator and the amazing things He has done for us. I desire to be considered wise and to turn many to righteousness. Because have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? The everlasting Father, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not grow faint nor become weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Yahweh has wisdom of knowledge and vastness of power. He moves mountains before one knows it. He alone stretched out the heavens and treads the waves of the sea. He performs great deeds that cannot be physically understood. Yes, miracles that cannot be counted. We praise you, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, as we know very well. Yahweh's works are marvelous, and we are part of his work. Our journey as part of his work has been filled with blessings, a.k.a. test, because what is man that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? We are being made into the people he wants us to be. He has shown you, O man, what is righteous, and what does Yahweh require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your Father? That is, does Yahweh require any more of you except to live by his every word? Yahweh, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you are mindful of him? As Micaiah 6, 8 and Psalm 144, verse 3 says, Yahweh is the most amazing being ever. What he is asking us to become is attainable. We can do justly. We do love mercy, and we all want to walk humbly with great Father Yahweh. I was taught by my parents, who were taught by the greatest teacher in the world, to look to the book of Yahweh and the perfect teachings from the house of Yahweh as my guide. Yahweh's inspired scriptures give me hope and comfort in times of trouble and joy in times of peace. But know that Yahweh sets apart the righteous ones for himself. For, for he hears us when we call him, for we strive to be righteous. So we may boldly say, Yahweh is our helper. We will not fear. What can man do to us? As Psalms 4, 3 and Hebrews 13, 6, 6 says, And in times of joy, I look to Psalms. Sing to Yahweh. Sing praises to his name. Extol our Father who rides the clouds by his name, Yahweh, and rejoice in front of him. Our souls boast in you, mighty Yahweh. The humble shall hear and have joy. As Psalms 68, 4 and 34, 2 says, the scriptures have comforted me. I am thankful to be standing here today. We are Yahweh's people, Yahweh's family. Yahweh is guiding you, and Yahweh is guiding me. Where can we flee from your presence? Where can we go from your spirit? If we were to raise the wings of dawn, or to dwell at the remotest ends of the sea, even there your hand guides us, and your right hand holds us. Know that Yahweh is our Father. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. For who is the Father besides Yahweh? And who is a rock except our Father? It is Yahweh who is my strong refuge, and he makes my way perfect. As Psalms 139, 7-9, Psalms 105, and 2 Samuel 22, 33-34 say, Yahweh hears when we pray. Yahweh helps us. Yahweh sees our efforts, and he knows our hearts. I challenge you to lead the scriptures into your daily life. I am so thankful to have parents who were taught by the greatest teacher in the world. Pastor, we are so glad to have you guiding and showing us how to obey so that we can become the people Yahweh wants us to be. Now may Yahweh himself, the creator of peace, sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept in safety, blameless to the coming of your king, Yeshua Messiah. He is faithful who called you, and he will also do it. I would like to thank the greatest teacher in the world, the great Kahan Yisrael Abel Hawkins, for allowing me to speak today. Please welcome the next speaker.
Hello, y'all may be seated. How are y'all doing today? So staying in the house of Yahweh and qualifying for a position in this eternal kingdom is as easy as A, B, C. So just like, <laughs> so just like the alphabet or the letters in the alphabet make up words, there are certain things that form us into immovable, unshakable pillars. So A is for attitude. We have to have the right attitude going throughout our day. So no matter what it consists of, do you take 150 phone calls? Do you make 150 dinner plates? Do you have to sit next to that person that clicks her pen 150 times for each phone call? <laughs> Whatever it is, we can't let the day-to-day -day get irritating or old. Um, you know, so what was Yeshua like? You know, we know he was a humble man. And he was never like, oh, Father Yahweh, 5,000, are you serious? <laughs> or if I have to cleanse one more leper, I quit. <laughs> no, no, no. He had the right attitude. He was eager to serve. He was thankful. He was considerate of others and joyful. Everything he did, I'm sure he did with a smile. So if you find yourself struggling to have the right attitude, here's some things that you can change in your life to make that transition. So instead of saying, I have to do this or I have to do that, you say, I get to. I get to make 150 dinner plates or I get to sit next to that person. You know, and uh, I also like to refer to jobs as activities because activities just makes it seem more fun, you know. <laughs> and sometimes jobs can be like, uh, again, you know. So you got to find a way to make it fun. Like if you're typing at a computer all day, maybe put on a House Yahweh CD and type to the melody, you know. Just whatever can get you by, you know. Having the right attitude can be a challenge, but it's possible. So B, believe is to have confidence in the truth, existence, or the reliability of something, although without absolute proof that one is right in doing so. But we have absolute proof that we are right in having confidence in the existence of Yahweh. So exactly, exactly how does one prove that Yahweh is real? Yisrael Hawkins. He's a man that we can see, so we see that he's real, and he's fulfilled every single thing written in scripture about the last day's witness. Um, you don't have to look far to find all the details about all the prophecies this man has fulfilled, uh, from his birth to his name, to what he'll be teaching, even to what he'll be wearing. Um, but what exactly is believing into the one sin? Uh, some time ago, it was pointed out to me that believing is obeying. So that has always been uh, believing in order to obey the one sin. And pastor never asks us to do anything for his benefit. Everything he asks us to do benefits us. You know, not eating in the restaurants, not watching TV or movies, entertainment, uh, not drinking. Everything keeps our mind and body healthy so that we can live a successful, peaceful, healthy, joyous life. And he doesn't... <laughs> Crazy alley. So Yisrael gives us the words of life. And if you ever find yourself questioning who he is or what you're doing here, I encourage you to go back to the basics. The house Yahweh established, the two witnesses. It's like that's what we're built on. Is the fa That's our foundation, you know. So, um, Israel Hawkins is here to help us help ourselves. So I'll just tell you this little bonus that I got a couple years ago. Um, I had a surgery to fix a part of my foot that was crushed when I was 15. But it wouldn't heal, and so I went back to the doctor, and we tried something else, and it didn't heal, and we tried something else, and it didn't heal, and it was back and forth, and this whole time I had this open wound in my foot. And um, so finally, the last option was amputation. The doctors, we were going to amputate my foot, and I was ready, let's get it over with, I'm done. So I went to go talk to Pastor to see what he thought about it. But of course, he didn't say, yes, go get your foot amputated, or no, don't get your foot amputated. He said, I'll pray for you. Let me know what you and your head decide. Yeah. 
So that was Sabbath. And so on second day, when I was at the nurse, after, you know, three years of seeing this woman, uh, she was cleaning my foot, changing my bandage, and she was looking at this gauze, and I don't remember what I was telling her about. But she was like, does that look like bone to you? And a piece of dead bone just fell out of my foot. And she'd been doing it for how many years? So um, she said she'd never seen anything like it. And I'm not saying that that was a miracle. I'm saying that Yisra Hawkins is in direct connection with the man. who has authority over the microorganisms. Yeshua Messiah. Just like Zechariah 6 says, they work together. Which brings me to C, courage. It took courage for me to tell y'all that, and it would have taken y'all courage to look at the pictures that I really wanted to show (laughs) y'all. But I know that not everybody's into that, so you're welcome. But it takes great courage to stay in the house of Yahweh. Courage is the quality of mind or spirit that enables us to face difficulty, danger, and pain. And I know that some days are hard, and sometimes we hurt, both physically and mentally. And Satan can throw some real ringers at us. Um, But we can't let her knock us down or cause us to crack. You know... Worldly family, negative influence, even within our walls. You know, that Judge Tana gave a great uh, speech about influences. Uh, We have to stand strong for Yahweh, even if we're the only one standing. But I guarantee you, you won't be the only one standing. (laughs) So, I forgot my blocks. I was going to have the ABC block so y'all could remember that it's about ABCs here. So, we can have a negative attitude and become bitter and crumble, or if you turn over to Hebrews 12, 28. That's why it's so easy to do that. Um, Since we are soon to be receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us hold fast to humility, that right attitude, by which we may serve Yahweh acceptably by believing in order to obey the one sent with reverence or courage, and awe. And I thank you for your time. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. Okay. Now, everybody knows that the theme of our feast this time is to believe into the one cent, part one. And what's the second part? Obey. Obey, Obey, part two. We have a two-part commission to be focusing on during our feast today, this, this time. So what I want to get into is I am going to give a brief explanation of believing into the one cent and obeying, okay? Now, I had put believe into the one cent and obey into the gematria, and I have three numbers that came up. The first one was 1890. And it's from 3051 in the Hebrew, and it says gift. Okay? Pastor Yisro Hawkins is our gift. He is giving us the keys to the kingdom through the instructions of Yahweh's laws, statutes, and commandments. We have a choice. We can either accept or refuse. Okay, those are our choices. The second word number that came up was 1854. Again, in the Hebrew, this is a primitive root, and it says to crush, stamp, made dust. Now, what does that bring to mind, made dust? The time period in, the, in these last days, which is the time period of the nuclear bomb. So we have the gift of Yahweh through pastor in these last days all into believe into the one cent. Now the third number was 309 and I went to the Greek for that because the Hebrew was a little bit confusing for me and I figured uh, that needs a little bit more study. So with the Greek it's very simple. It's from 308, it's a primitive root and it says receive sight. In other words, training. 
So right there, believing into the one sent. Now, into means to, uh, there's two definitions I chose. This, this is from the American Heritage Dictionary, into, and number C says, so as to be in or included with. So we want to be in or included with the one sent. That's, that's the one definition. The second one is to be interested in or involved with. That's what the into means, believe into. You want to believe into the one sent that Yahweh sent in these last days so that you are involved with his work. Okay, this is a two-part commission, as I said. And if you go to Deuteronomy um, 28, 1 through 14, it explains all of the blessings that Yahweh says we will receive. But we have to do our first part. We have to do the if part. If we follow Yahweh's commandments and statutes, if we follow the instructions from the one sent, if we listen diligently to the voice of Yahweh your father by observing and doing all his laws, if you if we, if I diligently observe and do all of the Yahweh's laws, and, and then you will not turn aside from any of the laws which I command you on this day to the right hand nor to the left by going after any God to serve it. If we do our part that the overseer instructs us to do, which is obedience, Yahweh will bless us. Yahweh will say, yes, you are, a, you are my trustful servant. Yes, you are admitted into the kingdom. Now, we're not the only ones who had to believe into the one sent. The people who left Egypt, when the tribes were pulled out of Egypt by the one sent in that time period, which was Moshe, they had to believe into Moshe, which means they had to believe what he was teaching. They had to be involved with what he was, he was teaching. They had to be involved, as the overseer said the other day, they had to prepare to leave Egypt. They couldn't just walk out the gates and be ready to travel for 40 years. They were given instructions by the one sent in their time period. And those that survived are the ones who followed the instructions. It's the same thing that he's giving us today. He gave us instructions. He's been giving us instructions for over 40, 50 years. Are we obedient to them? Or are we rejecting them? Okay, now, if they didn't obey, then they didn't come out. They didn't survive. They, they fell away, as we see that people are falling away now. So, um, as I was saying, the children of Israel also had to do their parts. But... Moshe also had to do his two parts. He had to believe into the one who sent him. He couldn't just do it. He had to believe into. He had to be involved with Yahweh. He had to be involved with the laws. He had to actually live the laws every aspect of his life. And then, not only that, he had to obey he had to obey what he was instructed. Could you imagine standing in front of a Pharaoh and having, you know, and telling the Pharaoh that, that you, you have to let my people go, otherwise this is going to occur, or this is going to occur, or this is going to occur? And the Pharaoh just stands there and looks at you and says, who are you? You know, but he still did it. He didn't want to be the one sent. He wanted to give his commission to Aaron. And Yahweh said, no, this is your commission. He could have chosen to reject it. But he didn't. He chose to accept it. We are in the same position in these last days. We have the choice. We can either choose the training that the overseer is giving us, or we can reject it, and we will not be a part of the kingdom. Now, as one of the speakers spoke earlier, the overseer has one cent that he believes into Yahshua, who it believes into Yahweh, and he obeys. So, the overseer is our perfect example of how to proceed in these last days and get ready for what's coming, get ready for the prophecies that are being, being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Even today, there's a prophecy that's in the making and being fulfilled as we are here under the protection of Yahweh. So I just want you to remember, okay, I'll break it down into a nutshell. We 
need to believe into the one set, which means we need to be a part of the one set. We need to be a part of this work. We need to do it with all of our heart, might, and soul. We need to do this as in Yakanon um, 20, oh, let me try and get the page. Yakanon 629, believe into the one sent and believe into him whom he sent. The, he was sent by Yahweh. That is our first part of our commission. The second part of our commission is to obey. Obey. And I struggle and I'm struggling and I'm overcoming. But I need a lot of help. I need encouragement. I need to pray. I need to study. I need to focus. But that uh, is our two-part commission during this feast. Believe into the one sent in these last days. As the Gematria says, the one that is in office during the time of the nuclear bombs. The one that is giving us a gift of training. The one that is giving us the training so that we receive our sight. And then obey everything he says. And with that, I turn it over to the next speaker. Shalom. Praise God. Please be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Now, for those of you who are new, I just want to let you know, don't worry about the weather, okay? This is Texas. It was 90 degrees yesterday. It's 50 degrees today. It'll be 80 tomorrow. It's all going to be okay. You get used to it, okay? So no stressing over the weather. So praise Yahweh. So I do want to continue on with, with our theme for today. And a few weeks ago, it's probably been about a, a moon ago, um, when the men were speaking, one of the young deacons made a comment. He said, we have to earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh. And that just really stuck with me. And I've really, the, ever since that, that day, I've really been pondering that and thinking about that because that's such a profound statement. We have to earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh because sometimes we do. We get caught up in the day to day. We get caught up in the grind. We get caught up in the testing. We get caught up with the sister we're struggling with or the situation we're involved in. And we get so wrapped up and caught up in that that we forget what an honor and a privilege it is to be here. Yes, it is. And Genesis 28, 17 tells us that this is the gate, the entrance to the kingdom of Yahweh. Sisters, when we get those emotions going and that testing and that trials and that nonsense, we need to back it down and go back to that scripture. This is the only way into the kingdom of Yahweh. And we've got to keep that in our minds. Now, just for a minute, I want us to set aside the prophecies, okay? Just work with me here, okay? Work with me. Just for a minute, set aside the prophecies and think of keeping the laws. We should want to keep the laws because we want to keep the laws because Romans 7:12 tells us the laws are holy and just and righteous. We should not be here just because, oh, it's all going to end. It's all going to end as long as I hang on till fourth day, fourth day it's going to end, and then I'm going to get in. Yahweh's not going to know I was only here because I thought it was going to end, right? We can't be here just because we've got the thought that it's all going to end. Now, it is. Don't get me wrong. I'm not speaking against the prophecies. It is. But the point is, we need to be in Yahweh's house for the love of being in Yahweh's house, Right? And that's really what I want us to focus on because, you know, we read in the scriptures and overseer said just not too long ago um, to read Hebrews 11. And throughout Hebrews 11, we see example after example of men and women who lived and died in the faith. These men, remember, the tree of life was cut off at that time. Salvation was not offered. They only had the promise of salvation. So they had to live their lives in and out, day by day, everything they went through, knowing they were going to live out their lives. And they, they lived like 800 years. I mean, come on. <laughs> they had to live their lives. They had to die and go to sleep, trusting, believing in Yahweh's promise that we would resurrect them and then they would get eternal life. But they did not live on a day-to-day basis. Nuclear war is going to start. It's going to be over. Nuclear war is going to start. It's going to be over. No, they lived their lives because they loved Yahweh's laws. 
And so I really want to encourage all of us, we've got to earn our right to be here, to set in our minds the keeping of Yahweh's laws are the only way to bring peace. They are the only way to bring joy. And that they will bring joy to our lives if we keep them perfectly and as we've been taught by Yahweh's house. So how do we earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh? Well, I'm sure when you, as soon as you hear that earn your right, you think Revelation 22, Revelation 22, 14. Yes. Blessed are those who keep his laws for they will have right to the tree of life. So we know right away our first thing in order to earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh is we have to keep these laws. And really, if you think about it, what better, you know, overseer said one time, what better law could there be than do not steal? What better thing could there be than do not murder? You know, and you may think to yourself, okay, well, I don't steal, but look at it from the other way too. If no one stole, then I wouldn't be hurt. I wouldn't be abused. I would, you know, it benefits everyone. What better law is there than not to murder, not to, to kill, not to take the death and take the death, take the life of someone else. You know, what better laws are these? These laws are our joy. Do you see it, sisters? Yes, this is what we need to focus on. And then in the next part, how do we earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh? What's our theme? Believe into the one sent. And of course, we all know Yachanan 629. We earn our right to be here when we believe the things Yahweh has told us. You know, if you just stop and think for a minute, put aside everything else, just stop and think that this man walks among us. This man who's fulfilled these prophecies, the one sent by the creator, Yahweh, is here to teach us how to get into that kingdom. Do we recognize what an honor that is? Do we recognize that? Yes. And we need to be thankful. There is no other man on earth who could do what this man has done. Okay. So I want to ask you, fact or opinion. You ready? The house of Yahweh has been established. Fact. Yes, uh, Bill Hawkins changed his name to Yisra Hawkins. Right. Yisra Hawkins teaches the laws and the prophecies. Right. Yisra Hawkins restored the book of Yahweh. Right. Fact. Do you hear those words coming out of your mouth? These are facts. We've got to get the emotion away from us. The emotion, the emotion, emotion, emotion. Blech. Get it out. Look to the facts when we're struggling, when we're having a hard time. Get in these books and look to the facts. You know, a great deacon gave a, a sermonette. It's been quite a while ago, but he gave the odds of one man fulfilling all these prophecies. Do you remember that? And it was like one in like 11 billion possibility that one man could fulfill all these prophecies. Well, there's only like 6 billion people on earth. So y'all do the math, Okay. So how many people could have done everything our overseer has done? One. And Yahweh designed it that way. Okay, cruising along. The next way to earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh is to be thankful. Positive law number 19. Right quick, I want you all to think, think just within your minds, five things you're thankful for. Ready? Go. You done? Too slow. Too slow. When we are thinking about things we are thankful for, they should just be coming, flying, going everywhere. We, there should be no thought involved in it. Now, if we want to complain about things, that should take some thought. Like we should actually have to reach down inside to, what can I, there's nothing to complain about. I have life. I have food. I'm walking. I'm talking. I'm living. I mean, really? We've got to prioritize. We've got to put things in perspective. We have so many things to be thankful for. And many, many years ago, someone told me to write out a list of 365 things I was thankful for so that every day of the year, I would never forget I had something to be thankful for. No matter what the day was like, no matter what went on that day, that every day I would recognize that I had something to be thankful for. Now, I don't always do it, I'll be honest with you, but I'm renewed, right? This feast just renews us, it gets us back in the swing of things. So I encourage you all, 365 things you're thankful for. It may seem hard, hard at first, but once you get going with it, it they're going to be flying out of you because we as a whole are a thankful people. Okay, uh, next thing, number four, how to earn our right to be in the house of Yahweh. As much as it is possible, be at peace with one another. 
right? The hardest thing you will ever have to overcome is someone else's shortcomings. Oh, wait. You can't overcome someone else's shortcomings, can you? Right. Okay? We can't overcome someone else's shortcomings. But I want you to think about it. Really, before these things fly out of our mouths, why does the House of Yahweh allow that to continue? Why doesn't someone put a stop to that? What if someone walked up to you and said that? Why does the House of Yahweh allow you to continue? Why doesn't someone put a stop to the way you're acting? It's a little different then, right? But I'm trying to overcome. Well, maybe that person is too. Okay? Just saying. So praise Yahweh. So as much as it is possible, be at peace with all men. And I'm running out of time because I talk too much. So I just want to end again where we started in Revelation 22, 14. And I'm going to read it exactly in, from the book of Yahweh. Blessed are those who keep his laws, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Make a nice sign of that. Write it out. Hang it on your bathroom mirror. Put it somewhere where you can see it and remember and recognize it. And never all of us never lose sight of the honor it is to be in the house of Yahweh. And I do pray that Yahweh will truly bless all of you. And if you'll please stand, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. So you don't think I'm the witness? Okay. So, what was your first clue, fact, or prophecy that you knew that I wasn't one of the two witnesses? I'm on the women's side, <laughs> okay? But I want to let you know that I am, and so are you, a witness to the witness. Yeah. Yeshua in Matthew 5.48 said, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, did he just dream that up? decide to say that without no reason? In Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, it says, you must be perfect in front of Yahweh, your father. And it's interesting to note as we go down five more verses from 13, in verse 18, right after he says, be perfect, he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I commanded him. That goes right over to Acts 3.22. And remember, that's one of the pastor's tag numbers about where Yahweh will raise up for your prophet among your people. Now, in 1st Yachanan 3, verse 7, I want to turn over there, 1st Yachanan 3, verse 7. It says, Little children... Let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. In Genesis 6, verse 9, it talks about Noah. It said that Noah was perfect in his begettings. In Genesis 17, 1, Abraham was commanded to be perfect. He had to get up and leave his family to go where Yahweh led him so he could become perfect. He was a friend of Yahweh. Let's read Jacob 1, verse 25, on page 953. Jacob 1, 25. It says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres consi continues persistently in it, he is not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. 
This man will be blessed in his performance of the law. So whoever looks into that law, anything you put your mind on and set your mind on day after day, as our overseer has for ever since he was a little boy, he will become that. In Eob 1 verse 8, Yahweh said that Eob was a blameless and upright man. Now, was he always that way? No. Because we know in chapter 10 of Ezra, he was on a list of men that had taken pagan wives. So we know that Eob had to become perfect. We know there is only one that was perfect, and that was Yeshua, but there was many that became perfect. Let's turn over to Isaiah 49, verse 2, on page 561. It says, And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. His quiver, in his quiver he has hidden me. So I, took, I went to the Strong's to look up the word shaft, and it's number 2671. And it means a piercer, a shaft, a spear. Also comes from another number, meaning a tree with its firmness. Hence the wood, the branches. From 1695 to fasten or make firm. Then I went and looked up polished. And it means to clarify, to brighten, pure, choice, chosen. Remember in Isaiah 44, verse 1, it says, Jacob is my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Hebrews, and then it went to another number, 2134, clean, clear, pure. It went to another number, 2141, transparent. Free from impurities, moral purity of heart. So then I went and looked, because it was talking about wood and branches, and the overseer is the resemblance of the olive tree. So the olive wood is hard, it's firm, it's strong, durable, withstands pressure or damage, has beautiful features in its grain, and it's natural antibacterial, I mean, it purifies. Some of the uses, or one great use of this here olive wood is that trumpets, the trumpets that were made, many of them, they used the olive wood to make the mouthpiece. Is that ironic or is that amazing that they would use the olive leaf where you blow that trumpet, trumpet by the one who was represented as part of an olive tree? So I, I'm here, I live here at Abel. And it says, ask at Abel. So I went to the gematria and I asked, Who's perfect? Who's perfect? 828, we know that's the overseer's birth date, and we've been told that 138 is a worshiper of Yahweh. So I said, well, what about that other number, that 1307? 1307, and it's in the Hebrews, a barathite, which comes from meaning the cypress-like, and then they went to 1265, and they're sort of confused when they really don't know what they're talking about, like the overseer said. So they said, a cypress, question mark, a tree. Hence, a lance, a spear, or musical instrument as that made of wood. And in the Greek, that 1307 means transparent. Revelation 2121 talks about the pure gold is transparent. It comes from 1223, a channel, something we go through. We go through Israel Hawkins and all his teachings and everything he's done for us so that we can learn to become as he is. It also means to lighten, to show, to shine, to think, to shine, brought forth into the light. It also means to make manifest, luminousness, to give light as reaching the mind, the nature of Yahweh. It goes to 53, 46, to show, to make one's thoughts and to speak. Now we know that Revelation 
10.7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh Malik, when he will begin to sound, the great secret of Yahweh would be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Now we know that there is who is perfect. Now do you think Israel Hawkins was always perfect? No, he wasn't. Just like everyone else before him except Yeshua. They had to become perfect. But let's go back and read Jacob 1.25 again. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, who do you know has looked into the law of Yahweh more than the overseer? Nobody. He, ever since he was a little boy, ever since he was probably in the womb, he clung to Yahweh's every word. And when you do that day after day for 84 and some, 84 years and some days, you're going to become that. And he has, Yahweh has showed us that our great overseer, can you that the he has become perfect. And he is teaching us how to become perfect. There is no doubt in whom Yahweh is sent. He has fulfilled all prophecies. And this is another prophecy about him that he has fulfilled. He has become perfect. Now, in Isaiah 49, verse 4, he, this is overseer saying to Yahweh, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing. I can't even imagine the overseer saying that, but at one point he must have because it says it right here. Overseer, just know that you, your works are not in vain. Your strength has not been spent for nothing. We are so thankful that you have done everything that you have done and that you are patient with us as we come to the perfection that you are. I hope I can take just one more minute. I have a knock-knock joke. I know you like my knock-knock jokes, okay? So remember how to play? I say, knock-knock. Olive. We all love the overseer, Yahweh and Yeshua. And may Yahweh be glorified. Let us all stand as I turn it over to another witness of the witness. Shalom, you may be seated. Let me get right into this. So when I was little, uh, my summer evenings were spent outside. And where, where I grew up, we had these bugs. Some of you may have had them too that flew around in the night and they were called, well, we called them lightning bugs. I didn't know until later that most people call them fireflies. <laughs> but um, so they flew around at night and they were beautiful and they let off this really bright glow and um, they were really friendly and they would fly right into your hand. And so what, what I would do is, you know, I decided one night to take capture a whole bunch of these and put them in a jar, in a mason jar, and set them beside my bed at night so that it could light up my whole bedroom while I slept. But, you know, by morning they were all dead. So the next night, I thought, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to put them in the jar, but I'm going to poke holes in the top of it so that they can breathe. And that was my bright idea. Well, by the next morning, it didn't work. They were all, they were all dead. So I thought, man, this is not, this is not cool. I need to stop doing this, right? So, so I didn't. I never did figure out how to contain these bugs in this, con you know, it contain them and keep them alive. So I just stopped doing it. And as I got older... I realized that I didn't really see the fireflies too much anymore at night. And I didn't think about why I didn't see them anymore. I just knew that I didn't see them anymore. And as I got older, you know, in the back of my mind, it never really left me because they were such a staple in my childhood memories, you know, these fireflies in the summer at night. And But I got to thinking about it, and it reminded me of how the world's ways are and how selfish they are to find things that are beautiful and that are free and that are natural and they try to you know take them and they try to contain them and they try to just suck the light out of them right until it's just no longer there anymore and for a very long time you know satan's been successful at extinguishing the light from this world and pastor said that there were little trickles of light here and there from different people you know keeping parts of the law like the ten commandments and so forth but for the most part the light was gone 
And the house of Yahweh's work wasn't known again, of course, until this last generation, this last time period when Yahweh once again allowed the house to be established and bring this light back to the world again. And so, and of course, he raised up a guide, right, as we all know, is our great pastor and overseer, Israel Hawkins, to lead this great work. And he raised up and hel uh, helpers and trainers, and that's all of us, to help him in bringing this light out to the world. And so Yahweh had this plan, and he knew that there would be this great work going on in the world once again, and that our great overseer would be the one that would be guiding this work and bringing the, the light, the education, the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding, you know, back to the people once again. And in the first book of Israel, chapter 20, verse 35, and Israel says, Pastor says, as, Rab as Revelation said to the congregations, you are the last congregation of Yahweh. You are the Western light that shines in the midst of the darkness here in this world. And that's you, that's me, you know, that's us. We're doing this great work right now. And in the first book of Israel in chapter 32, pastor says, but for you who reverence the name of Yahweh, the light of righteousness, here we see the light now that was given in the world once again and kept it for so long of a time period before it was finally pushed out. And he says, the more you push it out, the more sin creeps in. The light will arise with the people who reverence Yahweh's name. The light of righteousness will arise with healing in its wings. And he says, what's it going to do? It's going to start healing what's left alive, the light of righteousness in bringing back the earth to its productivity again, how Yahweh actually made it to produce. And that's a very powerful thing. And so we're it. You know, you and I, us together, we're doing this great job working under our overseer who's working under Yeshua Messiah who's being guided by Yahweh himself. And there is nothing in this world worth giving that up for. We have such a great position and such a great work to do. And we're under the greatest man who can do this work, as we've heard from the speakers before. We need not ever, ever let our light go out, ever. We need to finish this work and help our pastor to do that. And so um, back to the fireflies for a minute. So many years ago, many, many years ago, we had to go to West Virginia to pick up this vehicle. And we had to travel up this mountain to this little town that was nestled at the top of the mountain. And at the end of the day, when we completed what we had to do and we were leaving, it was towards you know sunset, um, we had to stop for gas in the town at the top of the mountain. And so as my head was getting the gas, I was in the vehicle, and I was looking to the side of the mountain. You know, it was kind of going up, and I was looking at the trees, and I was looking at the, the grass, and it was a really beautiful scene. And as I'm staring and I'm looking at it, I saw a flash of light. And I was like, oh, no. And then I saw another flash of light. And then the next thing I know, and the sun was going down really fast, so it was getting really dark. And I'm like, lightning bugs, you know, fireflies for those <laughs> You know, and there they were. They were they were everywhere. And so as as it was getting darker, you know, the whole entire mountain was lit up with the, with the they were up the mountain, down the mountain. They were everywhere. And the, the darker it would get, the more the the fireflies would come out. And it was just very emotional for me because I thought I had been waiting all of this time to see this light again, and I finally see it here at on, on this faraway mountain. And it reminded me of Matithia 24, 16, let those who are in Yada flee into the mountain. Now, these poor bugs were probably trying to escape all the little children who were trying to capture them in mason jars. But in comparison, I think of the world looking for that escape, you know, looking to where they can flee for help. And we know from pastor's teachings that that mountain, right, is the house of Yahweh, the uplifted place. And this is it. We're here. We're on this mountain spreading this light. We're here at the house of Yahweh. We are doing it. And the world can't bottle up this light. They can't contain the truth because it's not going to work. It's prophesied. And so they can try as they might, but this work will not die. And it may take some time for the masses, you know, to find out where it is. But as a team, as we continue to push this light out to the masses, they will find it and they will come. And when they see that light and that hope, that truth, once again, you know, it's going to be very emotional for them because they haven't seen that light and, you know, and they're looking for it and they don't know that it's the law, but they will know when Yahweh fl flips on their light switch to understand it, you know, but, but the thing is, 
when one of us decides to leave, it doesn't dim the light, right? Because Yahweh has more coming in behind us. It doesn't slow the work in the long run. It only hurts ourselves when we do that because that light is going to continue to shine and it's only going to get brighter and brighter and brighter as the multitudes comes in. So don't ever leave your light behind. Don't ever put that light down. Keep it with you at all times. You know, pastor has been given this job through prophecy to fulfill, and he will fulfill this mission. And we need to be right there beside him, helping him to fulfill it as well. You know, because as we've heard all the speakers before, we know it's our job to listen and obey and believe in the one sense, and we will be able to continue to push the slide out properly when we do that. And so... You know, let us not grow weary because the night is almost over and the day is almost here. So let us throw off the works of darkness, you know, and put on that armor of light. This Western light will never go out. Um, Just from the ninth book of Israel, pastor says, and now you understand it. You know that this was a prophecy that was written about us. And we're, of course, this Western light, as we see here, that never goes out. The Western light, the light is the knowledge that you are receiving through, of course, the olive branch, fastened to or whose foundation is Yeshua, the apostles and prophets. And he says here, it's such a beautiful picture. And what I want to do is leave you with a beautiful picture. Um, I know a lot of us here are visual people. And so I want I have a quick video that I want to show. It's about a minute long. And really, I just want to, the purpose of the video is to help us to remember how beautiful this light is that we have and to never, ever let it go and to always keep pushing forward this light out to the world so we can help pastor, you know, complete this job. And so if I could have the, the video, please. Okay, praise Yahweh. Did that bring back memories for any of you all when you were a child? The fireflies, praise Yahweh. It's just like those fireflies, Yahweh created it in them to never let that light down. We should be in the same way. We should. It should be our job to keep that light, pushing that light out to all the world so that they too can experience the peace and the joy and the love that we have here in the house of Yahweh. And we know we're bringing them too as well. So believe and listen to the one set and we're going to get this job done. Praise Yahweh. May Yahweh truly bless you. Shalom. You may be seated. I'm going to title my speech today, The Bench. And I wanted to show you this picture. And I know it looks like a bench by a fence. 
what it really is, picture this in your mind, that path coming this way is the path to everlasting life. And I put that fence there because it's so easy to go over to the path of everlasting death on the other side of the fence. And I put that bench there so when I start to head over the fence, I can sit down, shut up, and think about it. Remember when you were a child and they said, go sit down and think about it and see if you can figure out what you need to do. And I find a lot in my life that I have to do this. And I was thinking how in the scriptures they always show how they did wrong and they had to overcome. So <laughs> I figured maybe that's a great idea. So I'm going to start out with first the music. This is a weakness for a lot of us, especially that old tunes that you remember. And I had walked in a room last week and they were playing one of the old House Yahweh songs, but it was to a worldly tune. The ones that pastor said, stop listening to them. And I, for a minute, I caught myself wanting to listen to the tune and kind of remember where I was at that time. And then I said, sit down, <laughs> think about this. And sometimes you can do it real quick and you say, turn that off. We don't listen to that in the house of Yahweh. And the reason we don't is pastor says in the seventh book of Israel, part two, chapter 7, verse 17. Now, this is the world that we're dealing with, and we're also fighting, or that's what we should be fighting. But that's, let's see now. But that's the reason that we're working on the music now, remember? Y'all remember we didn't, we didn't have music for a while. He said, I want music in the house. You know, I love music, and we know he does. I love, I love, and everybody applauded. He said, but I can't see how you could you know, praise Yahweh and Satan at the same time. Because the music was made for Satan. You can put Yahweh's words to it, but that's a mixture of righteousness and evil. And it will lead us down over the fence. So, and then he says, I don't want them, do you? The audience says, no, praise Yahweh. Thank you, I'm glad you said that, and laughing and applause, and I totally agree with you. So we didn't have music for a long time. And then we had Yahweh's music. The music we have now is strictly Yahweh. It's his music, his words, everything is Yahweh. And that's what we should listen to. Okay, so I won that battle. I got off the bench and headed back down the path of righteousness. But then I can remember this one huge, huge battle I had with the Lucifer. And it was one time I had asked the overseer something, and he said, no. And I said, no, <laughs> to myself, no. He didn't say no because he said no. And I thought, well, there's other people doing it. You know, I, I see that occur there and that occurs here. And he told me no, and this is what's going on as I'm heading to the fence. And if you look, you can probably see real tiny there me climbing up the fence because that's what I'm thinking. How? I don't understand why. And then I sat down on the bench. And I, and I had to think about it, and I said, why did I come to the house of Yahweh? Did I expect all the answers would be yes? And I don't know why it's no. I just know that Yahweh leads pastor. And I started remembering Isaiah 43, that he's, you know, where Yahweh says, you are my witness. These are the things that brought me here. I heard that voice. Isaiah 2.2 and Micaiah 4.1, establish the house of Yahweh. These are the things like the other speakers. But these are facts. These things you can't deny. Zechariah 4, 2, 4, where he talks about the lampstand, the oil, and the olive trees. And then I'll, let's read to Zechariah 6, 12. This is a beautiful verse. Speak to him and say, this is what Yahweh of hosts says. Behold, the man whose name is the branch. For he will branch out from his place, and he will build the house of Yahweh. So as you're sitting on the bench... You have to know that this is the place to be. And if you get the answer no, there's a reason. And Yahweh gives it, Pastor, the answers, right? Where do the answers come from? From Yahweh. Have you ever said something you didn't know where it came from and you realized later it had to be Yahweh? So, when the, so finally I said, okay, I'm going to shut up and go back down the right path. But later, years later, you know, I could see why the answer was no. So we have to... I have to learn, I know we all do, we have to learn not to question the answer we get, because that was, to me, a big, big answer. So that's another learning experience. And Pastor says here, 
in the 14th book of Israel, part one, chapter one, verse four, how do I know that I believe the prophecies? The prophecies said in the generation, knowledge would be increased. Knowledge was increased in the generation starting in 1934. Yes, the computer was the internet idea. All of it started in 1934. What's the odds of that taking place? And think about it. What is the odds of that taking place? That everything that's prophesied occurred in his lifetime. The prophecy said it would. The witness was born in 1934. Yes, praise Yahweh. The last witness, the branch, was born in 1934. Yahweh's branch and all these other things took place in 1934 and brought the nuclear bombs and brought the TV sets and all the other things that we know was brought. So... Then it's our test in trials. And you know, they're not easy. And we, you have to wonder why, why is it so hard? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I get hit with a test and I climb up the fence and I just sit there a while and think, can I do this? Have you ever said, I, I can't do this? I don't think I can do this. I've said that, I don't say it anymore. Because when we say that, guess who hears you? And she says, oh, <laughs> well, let me see what else I can come up with. But there's another reason for these hard, hard tests. And in the 10th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 13, verse 3, pastor tells us, the trials and tests that I told you about with Abraham, I would like you to think on that just a little bit because, you know, you're involved in the same test or the same honor. Our tests are our honor. Yahweh sometimes, I think, he doesn't give us these trials unless he knows we're capable of coming through them. And that's a comforting thing because if you're getting hard tests, you can kind of say, well, Yahweh knows I can do this. I know I can do it if Yahweh knows I can. And so he knows you're capable of coming through them, you know, in an honorable way. But Abraham, Yahweh knew. He knew that Abraham would do this. And therefore, he placed this in front of him to give him honor. Now, this is Yahweh giving him honor. But in Yahweh bringing this about, we give Abraham honor when we read it because we know how dedicated, how devoted he was to Yahweh. So when they hear and read about our test, that's for our honor. And then, of course, we know in the 11th book of Israel, part 2, chapter 6, 25, but trials, the trials you have to go through in this, they can be big or small depending on the job. Now, get this depending on the job that Yahweh has in store for the kingdom, in his habitation and his house forever. These positions are, some are extreme. And of course, to prove that you're worthy for that job, then Yahweh may put some more tests on you. So when we're being really tested hard, know that Yahweh is perfecting us so we can fulfill the positions he has in store for us. And, we, and our pastor tells us over and over, be joyful in your test. And you think, how am I going to be joyful in this? My heart's breaking. But no, that's now. Be joyful in your test because the reward will be great. And there is nothing, nowhere else, anywhere to go but the house of Yahweh to get that reward. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Just want to remind you all very quickly, women, we have the peaceful scene tomorrow at the Peaceful Square. So don't forget your, yes, granite bowl, your granite cups. Yes, we will be serving tea. You may get refill if everyone doesn't drink it all. And your plates, because last time some people brought bowls and everything was put together like a one-pot meal. So you might want your plates, okay? Just a quick reminder on that. Okay, so now to my speech. Get all this racket out the way. And may the peace of Yah be with each and every one of you if I didn't say that. Now the title of my speech is going from you must to I must. Think about that. There's a big difference. So let's get right into it. The you must. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 5. Deuteronomy 12, verse 5. You all should be familiar with that scripture. It says, 
but you were to seek the habitation of your father, the house of Yahweh, the place which Yahweh, your father, shall choose out of all of your tribes to establish his name, and there you must go. Okay, so that's one of them. A you must. Now let's go just two pages over to chapter 17, Deuteronomy 17, verses 9 through 10. Go to the priests who are Levites, and to the judge who is in office at that time. Ask for their decision, and they will give you the sentence of judgment. Verse 10. You must act according to the sentence they pronounce for you at Abel, the place Yahweh chooses. Be careful to do all they order you to do. So you must. And when Yahweh says, you must... It's a command, isn't it? So where does I must come in? When I think of I must, I think of Yeshua. So let's go to Luke 2, verse 49. Luke 2, verse 49. Because he said this, I must. Luke 2, verses 49. And remember, he was trained up in the book of Yahweh. So he knew about these laws. He knew about seat the priests. He knew about seat the inhabitation of the, the habitation of the house of Yahweh. Luke 2, verses 49. It says, we know the story here, that he went to the house of Yahweh at that time, which was the temple. And he was like, okay, mom and dad, you do your thing. I do my thing. Right? And let's just go up there to verse 48. Let's read 48 going to 49. And when they, the parents, saw him, they were amazed. I mean, uh, sorry, they, the, the, fair, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all those people that was in the temple. Right? When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, um, I'm sorry, I think that was the parents. But his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? You know, why did you leave us? Why did you do your own thing and, 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 and hide, you know, go and not follow us, right, back home? Behold, your father and I have searched for you in great distress. So this is what Yeshua said. He said to them, why is it that you search for me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? You think about it. You must, you must, you must. When does I must come in? It has to follow, doesn't it? It has to follow because when you say I must to a command of Yahweh, you're choosing that obedience. You're choosing that obedience and you're showing it. So why did Yeshua also say I must? Well, let's look at the definition of must. We all know that the word must, if you were to... Say in your own words, you'll say it's a necessity, it's necessary, right? When you put the word must into a sentence, it's because it's necessary. But Merriam-Webster's Dictionary also says in the third definition, it says, be required by law, custom, or moral conscience. Be determined. Be unreasonable or perversely compelled to. Meaning you, you just have to do it. You know you have to do it. But this spirit, this spirit, I call it the spirit because it's, it's something that's almost, you know, intangible. You can't touch it. It's, it's something that's in you. The spirit of I must, when you, when you finally convert and you become a I must, it can occur at any age. When someone chooses to obey Yahweh's every word, it can occur at any age. And you have the spirit because... You want to keep it alive. And we know how to keep it alive by being in the house of Yahweh. I was nine years old when I first came to the house of Yahweh, and I've always wanted to bring this speech up, but um, I thought it was appropriate because my first feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. And after two years of enjoying the great feast um, of the house of Yahweh, my family decides to just leave you know, because of Ken folks and so forth. And I went through a battle. I went through a fight. And I was like, no, 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 no. 
So I was only 11 years old. No, 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 no. I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. And every Sabbath, I will sneak out of that church and go next door to the people who were keeping the Sabbath day because they were part of the house of Yahweh. At 11 years old. Because I must. I must keep the Sabbath. My dad got so mad at me. My mom was like, you crazy? You know, but I was like, no, I have to. I must. And I said, when the feast came around to Passover, I remember it was a Passover. And that family that was in the house of Yah at that time that I snuck to go keep the Sabbath with, they drove off. And I remember just being crushed. I'm like, can't you just sneak me in the back of your van, you know? It's, it's like, I want it to go. I must go to the feast at the age of 11. But I started, the seed was planted at the age of nine. And I bring this up because a few weeks ago, it's almost like Yahweh had it all planned. A nine years old approached me and said, out of the blue, what if I was taken out of the house of Yahweh? What if everyone left me? What should I do? And I said to that child, I said, you must fight to stay here at the house of Yahweh. It is the only protected place. Even for a child, you know this is the only protected place where they would not get harmed, where they would not get hurt, where they would not be defiled. And they could be used for peace, only for the purpose of peace. But see, I was thinking, I'm like, am I, you know, just saying you must to the child, is it enough? Just like the scripture, you must go to the priest. You must seek the house of Yahweh. Is that enough? No, no, it's not enough. So you almost want to like force a child. Now remember, you have to fight. You have to fight no matter what. But you can't force it on the child. And I remembered at the age of nine, it wasn't forced on me. The decision to want to be here at the house of Yahweh was never forced on me. The spirit of I must, I must obey, I must stay. I must be about my father's business. It has to grow on a person. That is why it's everyone's responsibility to your fellow sisters and brothers, rather young or old, to make it in their mind that they must, they must, they must, to where they can say, I must. You have to encourage it. You have to make it enjoyable. The work, it has to be enjoyable with a foul attitude is not enjoyable. So you make it enjoyable to be part of the work that I must be part of Yahweh's work. The Sabbath, it's enjoyable. You do your best to serve, to make it enjoyable for your fellow sisters and brothers. So they must, they have to, they feel it, that I must keep the Sabbath day. The same with the feast. Pastor said, share your time. Share your time to serve. Because in that service, you're planting a seed in a child's mind. You're planting a seed in a young child's mind of spirit, meaning the newcomers, to show them that they must be here. At the age of nine, and I'm going to testify this, we have today kohans, kohanas, deaconesses, and deacons, and when I see them sometimes, I'm like, I remember you. I remember you throwing snowballs at our camper. I remember you riding on that bike and getting in front of the car, and you just didn't care because you wanted everybody to see you on your bike. I remember when you were so kind to me, and Daddy wouldn't give me a glow stick, and you came to me, and you gave me a glow stick so I could play with you at night, but Daddy said, no, go to bed. And you were up all night throwing that glow stick in the air, and I remember thinking, oh, I want to be there, and that glow stick, we hit our camper, and I was like, Daddy, but they're playing outside. But those people that I grew up in the house of Yahweh, my family, my sisters and brothers, they're here today. And they share their time. And when I look at them, I'm like, wow, I want to be just like that. I must be like them. I must be of Yahweh's business. I want to end with this scripture. It's in Yachanan chapter 9. Verse 4. And I want you to put yourself in this shoe. Again, it's an example of Yeshua Messiah. Yakanon chapter 9, verse 4. On page 825, it says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
that's us too. We must work the work that Yeshua Hawken has sent us to do, has assigned us to do. The night comes when no man can work because the time is short. When that darkness come and that bomb is dropping like crazy, that's it. That's it. Now we can't prove ourselves anymore. So we have to prove ourselves by saying, I must work the work that Israel Hawkins has sent me to do. It's a must. It's a necessary thing. And in G3, whenever the opportunity and the reason arises, that opportunity is now. It's now. And Yahweh has reestablished his work to give us that opportunity. And it is a great reason. There's always a great reason to put your foot into the work and your hands to the plow. And never give up. And remember, we must, I must, no longer you must, you must, you must. It's I must. If you all please stand, I'd like to turn it over to the next speaker. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. Welcome home, saints of Yahweh. There is no place like home, where, you are, where your true family resides, where you have clean food, where you have righteous fellowship, and lastly, where you sit at the feet of the priest who teaches righteousness and peace in these last days. Welcome home. Praise Yahweh. The title of my speech today is The Three C's. It is established being in the house of Yahweh, we have many loves, right? We love the Father, we love the Messiah, we love the seventh Malak, and we love food. But I must admit to you, I like shoes. I like shoes. I just like it. Okay? My eyes glaze over, my eyes roll back whenever I see bows and polka dots. I like shoes. I need serious counseling for this, okay? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder what the workers of old shoes look like in my little mind, right? Sometimes I wonder if it looks like this. The sandals, right? You know, when you have a pair of shoes, you have it for a reason, to protect your feet against the elements, the weather, the rocks on the stony road. Right? But when I look at these shoes, I think of a journey. Right? The journey that we all must make just like the apostles. Which bring me to my first scene. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Found on page 944. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Okay, it reads, Yeshua Messiah, the apostles, one sent and the high priest over the house of Yahweh. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, sisters, every day this is what we should aim to be, holy brothers and sisters in the house of Yahweh. Just as Yahweh our Father is holy, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Yeshua Messiah, who was faithful to him, Yahweh, who beget him, just as Moshe was faithful in all Yahweh's house. So I want you to notice the word consider, right? Because we are going to consider the works of the apostles and Yeshua. Consider. Consider. Look at the highlights. Consider. I want you to focus on the highlights, to think carefully about, to regard as, to think, to believe, to regard with respect, thoughtfulness, honor, and esteem, to think deliberately or carefully, to reflect, to view carefully and thoroughly. And that was from dictionary.com, the definition of consider. So, sisters, consider the apostles and Yeshua. Why should we consider them? 
why should we look upon them and remember their works? Yes, because of Ephesians 29, 20 that says, we are built on the foundations of the apostle and prophet and Yeshua Messiah being the chief cornerstone. Yes, that is one reason. But I want you to also consider the example they set before us in our lives. Remember the sandals? Imagine it belonging to the apostles, sisters. Imagine that. Are we able to walk in their shoes? Are we able to do the works that they do? Are we? Can we stand strong and do the work even when we are persecuted and even killed? Can we do those works? We need to examine ourselves daily on these things. Yeshua was the most selfish, selfless man ever. He put, in his, he put his job first, always. He put his workers before himself. There was no pride found in him. He was not, he was humble, he was meek, right? He did not stick out his chest and say, look at me. I can look at me. He did not say, look at me. I can walk on water. I can command fishes. I can heal the sick. I can raise the dead. He did not say that. <laughs> he could have fed the multitude with five loaves and two fishes. Yes. I gave up so much to be here, Yeshua said, right? I gave up family, riches to be here. No, he did not. No, he did not. He did not say, no, you come and serve me. No. He served his workers. He abased himself and he said, not my will, Father, but may your will be done. Even until death, he was concerned about the work and his workers. You remember in Yakanan 21, what he asked Simon Kiefer? Anybody remembers? Huh? What he said, what he asked Simon Kiefer? Huh? Yes, he said that. Do you love me more than all else? That's what he asked Simon Kiefer. And what was his instruction to Simon Kiefer? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That was his instruction. Three times this went on for three times. Feed my sheep. Why did he ask Simon Kiefer to do that? Did we think about it? Why he asked that? Let me tell you why. You notice that um, Yeshua wanted the work to go on, right? So he needed his sheep to be fed, to be nourished, spiritual knowledge, right? Because you have to remember, back in those days, book two was not written as yet. It was not. It was the apostles that wrote it. So he wanted Simon Kiefer to feed his sheep so book two can be written for you and me. So that we can, Isaiah 34, 60, search the book of Yahweh. Not one of these things will be neglected. That is the reason why. For this future work, so that we can train, so that we can come to perfection. They were hunted down. They were killed by the sword. They were hung on a stake upside it down. But they endured and they did the work. Some of them wrote, um, Yakinan wrote, Ye revelation in jail. He did it all for us so that we can be the finishing touch on this plan, return salvation. Because remember, salvation was cut off. But through us, we can attain salvation. All the sisters and brothers of old, because of our works. Sisters, the apostles took accurate notes, accurate notes. And he always said a matter is established in two or three. One event sometimes was written more than once for our benefit, so it can be established in our minds. And then book two, when it was written, finished being written in 96, A.Y., what occurred to it? It was taken away and it was shut away for 1,500 years. It did not see the light of day. 
comfort for us. It was restored. It has to be restored. So, coming to my second C. I would like you to consider the second C, Pastor Israel Hawkins. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 21 to 24. We're going to go a little faster. In that hour, Yeshua rejoiced in the spirit and said, I praise you, Father, ruler of heaven and earth, and you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. May this be so, Father, for this seem right in your sight. All things are given to me by the Father, and no man fully knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and the one to whom Yahweh wills the Son to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes which see these things that you have seen. For many um, prophets and kings have wanted to see these things which you see, but none have seen, and hear the things which you hear, and none have heard. I would like you to look at the Amplified Bible. Remember it said the hidden things, right? If you look, in, look on the monitor, it will say what these hidden things are, the Amplified Bible. It explains it a little more. The hidden things relating to salvation, right? Those are the hidden things. And who will reveal it? Yeshua said, who will reveal it? The one he chooses. And who did he choose in these last days, sister? Who did, he, who did Yeshua choose in these last days to reveal these things, to open the seals? Israel Hawkins, yes. Remember, the secret things belong to Father Yahweh, right? And I want help with this one. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and yeah. there a little, yes. The great secrets which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Turn with me very quickly to Isaiah. To Isaiah 43. We're going to read a little bit about your, um, about Overseer, the prophecy of Overseer. But now, starting in verse 1, but now, this is what Yahweh says, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. For fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. You will pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, and they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor will the flame kindle you. For I am Yahweh, your father, the Holy One of Israel, because you were precious in my sight. You have been honorable. I have loved you. So I will give men for you and people for your life. Sisters, do not take these prophecies for granted. The one chosen in these last days, as Yakanan chapter 5, the pattern said by Yeshua said, I alone, if I alone testify on my behalf, my, testi my testimony is not what? Is not valid, yes. So that if Israel Hawk is certified upon himself alone, his, it will not be valid. But he was talked about by the prophets of old, the ones who came before us, from the apostles to Daniel to Genesis, Isaiah, they all spoke about him in these last days. So sisters, do not neglect your calling. Do not give up on this position you are being offered in these last days. And, and my third C, I'll give you homework, I can't get to it. My third C is I want you to consider one another, right? I want you to consider one another. All of us who's walking in this path that we are going through now. And I want you to read 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 7. And in Mark, in these last days. And look at the things that some of us will be doing in these last days. Sisters, consider one another. Are we helping our sisters? And I would like to turn this over to the next speaker. Shalom, great saints of Yahweh. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Please be seated. Now, I see the time, so I'm going to go a little quickly. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of us and those who are also joining us over the media. Um, 
Our theme for the feast is believe in the, into the one sent and obey. I would like to call my title, my portion today, um, Who Touched Me? Who Touched Me? Who Touched Me were the words of Great Yeshua. You remember that? In Luke chapter 8, I mean Luke chapter 8, now there was this woman, there were no telephones in those days, Luke chapter 8. We're reading about uh, 43 to 48. Ah, no telephones in those days, no WhatsApp, no Google, no nothing like that. But this woman heard about the one sent in those days. His name was Yeshua Messiah. She heard about him. She had an illness. You can read about the illness yourself. 43 to 48. She had an illness. She went through many things, the great ones, and told us. Uh, and it is written, through physicians, doctors, whatever have you, she suffered many things through those people. But when she heard about the great Yeshua, the one sent in those days, she said, I am going to be healed. Did she believe in the one sent in those days? Oh, she sure did. Could you have stopped her from going to Great Yeshua to be healed? No, you could not have. She said, I am going to be healed. So she heard that Great Yeshua was going to be over there um, on that day. So she said, everybody, I'm going. I am going. So she went and the crowd, a big crowd going back and forth. You've been in crowds and they go this way and that way. And she saw it was over there. So as soon as somebody moved across a little bit, she got a spot and she went in. And she touched the end of his, she touched the titsits of his talit. Don't go, I brought my titsit, I want to show you. Yeshua has his talit on. And here comes that woman. She said, I am going to be healed. She believed in the one sent. Nobody could stop her. So in a crowd, Yeshua is moving back and forth of the crowd, you know, everybody came because they heard Yeshua was coming. And um, she just swept the end. No, it's not funny. It's nice. It's very nice. Is it not like marrow to your bones? It's marrow to my bones. So, listen to Kiefer. Ke Yeshua said, who touched me? Yeshua said, who touched me? I felt the power drain from my body. Kifa said, but great Yeshua, let's be practical. You know, we've been in that crowd for the whole day, going back and forth. Um, um, and suddenly you jump in and you say, great Yeshua, you know, you said, who touched you? Yeshua said, someone touched me. I felt the power drain from my body. So, when the woman realized, yeah, she wouldn't know somebody touched him. She said, oh, yeah, she, it's me. Um, uh, so and so and so and so and um, I believed into the one sent. So I came and I touched the tip of your titsit and I am healed. Now, here's what. When you understand what the illness was, you realize it's not right away, you know? Um, just read it and it would take some time. But she was healed. So I'm going to ask you three questions. Number one, answer. Number two, answer. Number three, don't answer. <laughs> or answer in your mind. Number one, do we have a one cent in these last days? 
Very nice. That was number one. Number two. What is his name? Very nice. Do not answer this one. How does your belief in the one sent today compare um, with the belief of the woman, that woman who touched the tip of Yeshua's tidzit? Ask myself, how does mine compare? How does yours compare? Do not answer. Uh, how, how does it compare? There must be a group of people in these last days who will pray to Yahweh with uplifted hands. They will believe into the one sent like Yahshua himself believed into the one who sent him, great father Yahweh. And remember the great overseer last sab on sab when he spoke, he had his Yahweh flashcard. They will believe into Yahweh. And if Yahweh says, Israel Hawkins is my one cent, then they believe this is the one cent. Do you agree with House of Yahweh? There must be, there must be a group of people in these last days who will believe Yahweh like Yeshua. They will pray to Yahweh like Yeshua with clean hands and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, who is in heaven. There must be a group of people in these last days because the dead have to be raised. We were commissioned to heal the sick, raise the dead, give sight to the blind. Those things were commissioned. There must be a group of people in these last days to do it. Believing into the one sent. Well, I don't believe in any man. I don't want to confess my sins to any man. As I heard, Father is not going to call you on the telephone. There must be a guide. There must be a great teacher. There must be one to say, okay, tomorrow we are going to do this. There must be a group of people in the last days, in this last generation, who will be able to say, like Yeshua, know the Psalms and everything, and they can say, in the pavilion, knowing that Yahweh is going to protect us, protect them, they will say and can say, in the pavilion, in your tabernacle, in the secret place, you will hide us. They will be sure that Father will hide them in the secret place. There must be that group of people. The great one sent said recently in his sermon, he's talking about believing. We have to believe in Yahweh. Yeshua believed into the one sent. He believed in Yahweh. Law number one, Yeshua did that. Uh, and the great one sent, he spoke a couple of weeks ago and he talked about Psalm 19 and he gave us a nice scenario, Psalm 19. And he said, he was reading down, and when he got to verse 9, he talked about the reverence of Yahweh. He said, the reverence of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. He said, the judgments of Yahweh are true and altogether righteous. And he talked about a little bit about the judgments of Yahweh being true and perfect. And then he said, talking about Yahweh, he said, he does not twist it to make the other person look bad. Talking about Yahweh. Yahweh does not twist it to make the other person look bad. In Psalm 82, we know Yahweh sits in the council of the gods. You God, what do you have over here? What do you have to say? Yes, yes, that's it. Let us obey, believe into our own sin. And there's a reason he said this, and he explained it nicely. And I brought a piece of rope to show you something. This rope is not twisted. This one is twisted. 
make the other person look bad can, have a, can come in different ways. A lot of different forms. And read about influences. And they're subtle. You see this rope not to be said, it's just curly. Um, did she bring back my 500 crayons I gave her? Yes. No twisting. Straight answer. Yes. Twisting can take a lot of different forms. Why would he, the great ones and tell us, do not twist it to make the other person look bad? You see, um, what, was she on time this morning? Um, well, you see, we have two clocks in our office. One five minutes fast, one five minutes slow. So I did not see exactly what time she came. And um, so I'm not quite sure. But if you really want to know, um, well, I can find out for you another time. Let me tell you what twisting does. And there's a reason why he said it to us. When you twist and twist it to make another person look bad, we are building building those microorganisms that are mutated uh, and breeding strife, contention, malice. It's the microorganisms in our system. That's why he said don't twist it because it's going to hurt us. Not so much the other person, you know. It comes back at us. Believe in Yahweh as the only source of power in the universe. Yeshua had that covered. You could not let Yeshua go from the left to the right. The great one sense believe, the great one sense, sorry, he believes into Yeshua. Likewise, there has to be a group of people in these last days who are going to believe into the one sense. And there will be great things done. Great things done. Very great things done when we obey and believe. Praise Yahweh. And with this, I turn over to the great priest of the house of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh.